So thanks for coming on the line with us today. My name is John Dubas. I'm a Vice President of Agent Success with Premier Marketing, and we'll be spending the next 45 minutes or so discussing some of the opportunities you have to market the Medicare population with a bit of knowledge about extra help programs, low income subsidy, LIS. Today's presentation is being recorded and the link to the presentation along with a PDF of the PowerPoint along with some other reference material will be sent to all who have RSVP'd to today's webinar. A bit of additional information about our organization before we start. Um, Premier is a national marketing organization founded in 1968. That's part of the Integrity Marketing Platform. We have offices across the country acting as an insurance wholesaler working with independent insurance agents offering contracts at the highest possible commission levels with recruiting contracts available to those who qualify. As I mentioned, we were founded in 1968, so this past year we celebrated our 50th anniversary. It's a testament to the mindset of service that the organization has for its agents and its carrier partners as well, and it's an accomplishment of which we are very proud. To grow from a small family agency in rural Nebraska to one of the largest organizations of its type is evidenced by the ranking of the production that we have with the agents we served, we serve and the carriers with whom they contract. We are the largest producer in the Medicare Advantage world for United Healthcare, for Anthem, for Meridian Care, and for Aetna as well. So it's a testament to the support that is given to the agents with whom we partner. This gives you an idea of the offices across the country of our platform partners and the organization with whom we affiliate. We do offer a full insurance portfolio, including Medicare programs in the Medicare Advantage and prescription drug world and Medicare supplements as well. Additionally, we offer a full portfolio of life insurance and annuity programs, including final expense life insurance and pre-need plans, long and short-term care, disability income programs, and ancillary programs to help fill the gaps in the programs that are based medical programs as well, including additional uh, plans that are available for dental, vision, and hearing needs, critical illness and cancer programs, and hospital indemnity programs as well. That Medicare Advantage portfolio includes all the big boys and a number of the most needed regional players in the market. Same thing applies in the standalone prescription drug world. And our portfolio of Medicare supplements is very broad and very competitive as well. The ancillary programs are also an area where an agent has a lot of opportunity working with our organization in those categories that we mentioned uh, uh, just a second ago. Additionally, what we're gonna look to go through today is give you some information about the Medicare market, how it's affected by 2019 regulatory changes, and how low income subsidy and the, that assistance program, the extra help program, can make a difference for an agent who works the Medicare market but it is not fully fledged into the dual beneficiary segment of the population. We will touch on Medicare savings programs as well and other beneficiary assistance programs very briefly um, and also spend a little bit of time on the marketing support you get from our organization. For anyone who has worked the Medicare market in for any length of time, we realize that folks as they come into Medicare or are part of that program, they have a couple of different ways um, that they have avenues in order to seek help for the base Medicare coverage that is set before them. Many folks choose to remain in traditional Medicare administration and pick up a Medigap policy or in some circumstances self-insure for those monies that are uh, owed for services rendered that aren't covered by uh, completely by Medicare. Some of them pick up a Part D program as well, the majority of them, and some choose to opt into the Medicare Advantage programs, also known as Part C, and work the system in that fashion. It's a, a 
opportunity for us as agents because we help supply the information that helps people make those decisions. And one of the reasons we do so is this is such a burgeoning market. Marketing organizations and carriers always speak to the fact that the baby boomers, well, we're, they're aging, we're aging, um, 10,000 people plus a day aging into Medicare. And when we take into account the fact that that's not the entire Medicare population, it's just a big portion of it, the folks under the age of 65 who qualify for Medicare assistance because of health circumstances, we realize just what a huge market this is. It is a market, however, that much like the choices they have for additional coverage, there are different factors that and characteristics that play a part as to what might be the best choice for an individual. And that, again, is where we come into play, offering some assistance with information about the different choices they have that might best serve them because of their income, because of what their bodies are doing. Um, and that information becomes very important, especially when we consider some of the extra help programs, since the median income for a Medicare beneficiary is $26,200. Many times folks would like a Medicare supplement program and a standalone prescription drug plan, but they simply cannot afford the premiums that are involved. And when we look at some of the particulars in the, the drug programs, be they standalone plans or integrated into Medicare Advantage programs, we can see how the extra help programs can make such a difference in the lives of the populations that we serve. When you look at the fact that at $25,000 a year as an income, over well over half of the Medicare population uh, is affected by the financial constraints that they encounter each and every day, we realize why programs such as extra help, low income subsidy can make such a difference for them. Many of the people that we serve also, well, their income is constituted basically by Social Security. And it gives us a way of asking a few questions that helps us determine if they qualify for additional assistance. And we look at the number of people that are below the federal poverty level in itself, we realize there may be even more help for those individuals. When you go up to 150% of federal poverty level, which is the maximum a person can have as income and qualify for some type of assistance, we can just see by the numbers how huge that market is. One of the other things that we see as well, in addition to those financial constraints, is the, the actual movement within the market itself. Um, surveys show that Part D beneficiaries are paying more even for generic drug prescriptions, despite, despite the fact that the market for those medications has remained unchanged. That doesn't mean the cost have, however. Drug companies are increasing costs on different medications, and the health plans are also changing the formularies that are coming to play for the coverages that are involved. And this may be more than just inclusion of drugs on a formulary. It may be how those drugs lay out in coverage within that drug plan. They may be on different tiers, and we're seeing much more movement in that area, which is just another reason why we need to ask some additional questions in, in order to help people with the drug costs that are, well, as the, the bottom line of this says, it's costing patients nearly $6.2 billion, which is a 93% jump in the patient cost in a four year period alone. So it's a real need for us to be up on the different assistance programs that are in play not only to help a person remain uh, compliant to the prescriptions that are laid out for them to deal with what their body is doing with them, but also a means in order to make that a real possibility when it comes to their budget. We also see that some of the other things that coming into play is the, the prescriptions are just an indication of the fact that that portion of the drug cost then has a huge effect on their other benefits of their programs as well. 
when you look at Medicare Advantage programs, they are paid basically per member per month for the folks that are enrolled into their programs by the government. And those dollars that they receive then are broken up into different benefit costs that have a bearing upon not only the prescription out-of-pocket outlay, but also it affects what benefits may or may not be available to them on the medical side as well. So the implications of the cost of medications go well beyond just the cost of the medication itself. Some of the other things that we face in this portion of the world when we deal with medications costs, well, there are always newer and more effective medications that come into play. As a person who went on a blood thinner this past year, this strikes very close to home. If we deal with Coumadin or its generic form of warfarin, you can see that this medication is now obviously as warfarin available on a generic basis and has become fairly inexpensive when you look at it in the wide range of things. However, one of the medications that is being prescribed as an alternative to many people is multiple times per month the cost. What we have as a reasoning for that is, of course, not only perhaps the, the range of effectiveness of the medication itself, but also the side effect of the medications that are involved as well. The Xeralto does not require as much blood work, uh, some of the other things that come into play with uh, a blood thinner. So what we see is not only um, changes within a formulary, changes within the tiers within a formulary, changes of the prices of the medication, we're also facing a difference brought about by alternatives to a medication as well. What we deal with then with the cost of these medications and the programs that are out there that help people with the cost of medications um, in 2019, we're seeing some differences as to the regulations that come into play for us as agents to help people through special election periods and how that comes into play. The MA coverages themselves, um, the premiums um, are down just a little bit. Most of the Medicare Advantage folks have alternatives and choices that are across the board, particularly in more populated areas. And in most cases, the Medicare Advantage programs have the drug coverage integrated into the program itself. That's why we speak to it in this manner. It also is seeing a number of these programs have different types of benefits that are available to them, um, different types of additional supplemental benefits that they didn't have access to before. And we're going to see an even greater emphasis of that in 2020. So it's something that as we speak to the core benefits of the programs that um, are available to our prospects and clients, knowing how drug costs affect the overall benefit structure makes a big difference on how effective we are in explaining the, the alternatives for our prospects and clients. One of the things that has changed for us in 2019 is the special election limitations that have been placed on the Medicare, Medicaid, and LIS eligible individuals starting at the first of the year. Where in the past, this had been a continuous special election period where folks in this circumstance could change their coverage each and every month should they choose to do so. Now it's a quarterly special election period where in the annual election period in the last quarter of the year, that change is made available to those individuals instead of the SEP as well. Some of the other things that come into play is they have split up some of the folks that qualify within the extra help piece of this, the low income subsidy um, and the MSP programs based on the medications that those people take as well. If they are at risk, um, some folks may not be able to use the special election period as they had in the past. So getting the information on how uh, this affects the people we deal with, well, one of the things that comes into play right off the top is 
how do we know if someone has used the special election period in the quarter in which we're visiting with them? And um, how then do we help a person prepare for their election period options and their effective dates, most importantly, with this limitation coming into play? The vast majority of carriers that we are visiting with on an ongoing basis strongly suggest that an agent who encounters a person in this situation or in the past, they had the monthly SEP so they could enroll a person in a different plan without worrying so much as to whether or not a, the individual qualified for it, they are asking that you speak to their producer help desks in order to verify that that special election period is available to them. We have some additional information available to you here from CMS on those changes and updates as well. Some of the other things that come into play, as I mentioned before, um, the splitting up of the LIS SEP and how that is uh, a change for folks that are at risk. So those folks that are um, affected by different medications such as opioids and are at risk for different types of abuse or um, other adherence to, to medication protocols, those are folks that may not have the opportunity to change even quarterly based on some of the situations that they have with the medications that they take. So we wanted to make certain that you knew of these changes. Um, is it going to be widespread? I think that's something we're going to encounter as we run across more of these individuals and the medications that uh, they are taking. It really, really stresses the fact that we really need to be effective communicators when it comes to the type of medications that an individual has and whether or not a change is the appropriate thing for them on an ongoing basis. Additionally, during this time period, we we're also affected by changes in some of the base enrollment periods where the MADP program, the disenrollment period that we have seen in the last few years has gone away to be replaced by the MAOEP period, which is the first three quarters of the year. And this is a program that gives a person who is in an MA program the opportunity to change their coverages. This SEP, or this enrollment period, I should say, um, can be utilized but once a year, and folks that are aging in are, rec it's recommended to those individuals that they look at the different choices they have for changing their coverages to make certain that it is appropriate for them. The Medicare savings accounts and cost plans are not included in this election period. One of the things that we see is cost plans have different SEPs made available to them, and so that is a big bearing as to whether or not they were included in this period. So people in OEP, if they're on an MA plan, as of the first of the year, they can switch MA plans from one plan to another. They can switch from MA and go back to original Medicare, coordinating it with a Part D special election period to pick up a standalone medication coverage. Um, they can add or drop Part D plans when they're switching in this circumstance. The Part D um, is not guaranteed unless a person, to add that, unless a person was in the MA plan when the person is already on Medicare. It doesn't allow for a switch from one standalone PDP plan to another, and a person cannot pick up an MA plan if they're still on original Medicare. So it's not an extension of the annual election period. It is specific in its intent and is an opportunity for folks who are on an MA plan to make specific changes based on their needs and the changes that they encounter as they have enrolled in a program. Um, this gives you a timeline of those election periods and some of the special election periods that we see most frequently. One of the things that we also have to be very aware of are folks that are coming off the health insurance marketplace on, trad on traditional Medicare, um, and this is a 
opportunity for us to also impart some wisdom as to the options that a person, if they're coming off group coverage or marketplace standalone coverage, what is necessary in order to be eligible to make that change. And when we have a particular informational webinar on that as well. It's important to note that Medicare isn't part of the marketplace and the OEP for Medicare and the OEP for Marketplace have different dates. They overlap in the fall, but they are not the same timeline um, for both programs. This gives you some additional information on the landscape for MA and Part D programs. So as people visit with you about uh, their coverages and keeping in mind, we're not to market specifically to uh, encourage people to change programs where there is a resource. This gives you additional information to help those folks make an informed choice. Some of the options that are affected by low income subsidy and Medicare savings programs, we have specifics from the National Council on Aging that can help you. These are live links to presentations given by that organization specifically on the differences between those programs, and we're going to cover that in, in some detail today, but this gives you an option to look at it from an impartial third party as well. I will confess a lot of the information we pull is from CMS and the National Council on Aging, so you'll see some very familiar material. The folks that do qualify for the extra help can really take advantage of some of the advantages that that assistance renders to them based on income and assets. It can really affect the plan premium for the standalone uh, drug benefit or the benefit that is incorporated into an MA program as well because the Medicare Advantage programs will split out in many circumstances premium that is charged based on the medication benefit within that plan. And if a person is on low income subsidy extra help, that can affect what they technically pay for the MA plan as well. It obviously also is an override of the applicable co-pays, co-insurance, and gap in that medication coverage. Um, so a person on a Part C or a Medicare Advantage program, if they qualify for the extra help, they see much lower out-of-pocket exposure if they have the LIS pieces in play. One of the things that it doesn't affect is the medications that are available on that plan. The formulary still comes into play, as do any requirements that the plan has for step therapy or quantity limits for the medications that are covered uh, by their prescription benefit. If you have someone who has Medicare Part C and they're going back, low income subsidy once again affects the premium that is charged for a standalone program or if a person has enrolled late into medication coverage, it also covers the plan premium penalty. Once again, it does affect the co-pays that a person has on the standalone plan that they pick up. It affects the co-insurance and coverage gap as well. And again, it does not affect the medications that are available through the standalone plan, the step therapy and, qu step therapy and quantity limits that are put into place by the company offering that medication program. If a person's switching, once again, we're seeing much of the same influence um, within the programs. So you can have an MA program that has a specific set of co-payments and co-pays and coverage gap, and they change to another program, and both of them may be enhanced by the assistance they get through this standalone program as well. For the folks that switch from one plan to another, that same set of circumstances applies. If a premium is uh, uh, in play on the new Part C plan that they select, the low income subsidy can subsidize that should it be at the national average or below. And once again, addresses the plan premium they may have incurred by not enrolling when they were first 
eligible for prescription coverage. The same things apply then as well for the co-pays, co-insurance, and GAP, where it is affected on a standard basis by the coverage level set by low-income subsidy extra help and doesn't affect some of the base workings of the program as to the medications available and how they are available as well. Um, so one of the things that we do see as a difference is the fact that a Medicare savings program does give a person the option of changing not only drug coverage, but also the base medical coverage. And what we have seen um, as an effect of this is the fact that low income subsidy constraints are rolled into the assistance of the Medicare savings programs. So we see many of the same effects come into play for someone who is picking up an integrated medical and prescription drug coverage. It does also affect Medicare savings programs, that is, a planned choice in many circumstances if a person is looking at a special needs plan and what is necessary to qualify for that. A Medicare savings program, if above 100% of federal poverty level, so we're looking at Slimbies and Gwimbies, those folks are best served with a traditional, in most circumstances, a traditional Medicare Advantage program um, the folks that are full dualies are best served with a special needs plan, a dual program, a DSNP. Um, in many cases, the carrier requires at least the Quimby level in order for the individual to qualify for that special needs plan. We'll go over that in a little different detail in just a bit. Um, so what also it gives us an opportunity with a, a Medicare savings program is switching them back to traditional Medicare, which is in essence, in, in, in a way, an extension of the OEP program for the first three months of the year to throughout the year on a quarterly basis. The same provisos of the program comes into place as well. You also see the Medicare savings programs affect an individual who looks to drop their prescription coverage. Why they would do that, I have no clue unless they go back into perhaps um, employment and they have group coverage or they're a veteran and they feel best served just by the VA system, but it is an option for the individuals. This is kind of repetitious of the slide that we had for the low income subsidy because the plan switchers are affected in exactly that same way with low income subsidy versus Medicare savings programs as well. So the value that a prospect has in general terms for either of these assistance programs, the low income subsidy or the Medicare savings plans, is it gives you an opportunity to help that individual maximize the benefits that are made available to them and take into play, uh, consideration in play the fact that different programs that they may have not been eligible for in the past, you can uh, positively affect the benefit package that is available to them since the prescription coverage base cost factors are positively affected by these programs um, by affecting the co-pays, the co-insurance, and the coverage gap that they have for those prescription programs. What it really does for you as an agent is one, it gives you the peace of mind that you have done what is best for your prospect. It minimizes some of the differences between the actual plans because in some markets, one program might have a much stronger network, um, but the benefits may not be quite as robust as another plan when it comes to prescriptions. And this is the great equalizer for the programs in that, in that circumstance. It also makes your program more persistent, stickier. It makes it harder for someone to replace your product that you have put into uh, play with your prospects and clients because you've enhanced their benefits and you've gone that extra step to make certain that your prospect and clients have the minimum of out-of-pocket experience that they um, can see regardless of the carrier that is offering the base coverage 
because of the override put into place by the drug subsidy. It can also give you the opportunity in certain areas that may not have as many plan choices, an enhancement over the overall programs that are available to them, because we do see in many of the major markets where competition drives a strong benefit package in comparison to a much more rural circumstance where the competition may not be as fierce and the plan availability may not be as robust either. Additionally, many of the folks that are eligible for these assistance programs may not have it in play. And as you help folks qualify for this assistance, it does create that special election period that they may not have otherwise that allows you to change their coverages throughout the year. It gives you then also a opportunity to manage your time in the different marketing periods as well, where folks that as you had approached them at the end of the annual election period and they had an opportunity to change their coverage after that period ended because of this special election period, it helped you work your book of business more effectively. One of the things that you see as well is as you help people qualify for these coverages and you make them aware of the extra assistance that is available to them, it really increases the likelihood of a, a referral. And we all know the most effective marketing program that's out there are people that you help telling other people about the help that is available through you. So you have a greater opportunity for referrals um, because of that extra step that you took, making certain that you maximize your prospects and clients' benefits. One of the things that you see as well is for folks that have not had these assistance programs in place in the past, you're dealing with an individual that has a bit of a different mindset than someone who is a full dual beneficiary for some time when they don't realize that this, these programs can make such a huge difference to them. They've taken it for granted now. So folks that haven't had this assistance and you make it available to them, well, those folks are very, very appreciative of your efforts and it really helps with your overall persistency and the marketing efforts on an ongoing basis for many of the reasons we've already gone through. When we look at the low subsidy programs themselves, one of the things that comes into play is the fact that the average basic premium across the country went down for the first time in a number of years, and this can affect then the subsidy that is, comes into play when you look at the different standalone programs or the costs that are affiliated with medication coverage in MAPD programs because that subsidy may be fully funded with one program and not the other based on the premiums that come into play with the plans that are put into place for those programs by the insurance companies offering them. And you'll see a difference of that base average on a state-by-state -state basis. Here in the state of Texas, we see fewer fully subsidized programs available year over year, 19 versus 18, uh, not as many choices that are fully covered. And you'll see that in other states as well. Some of the other things that come into play by simply the calendar turning is the coverage gap, coinsurance changes for individuals who don't have full assistance. So you're seeing a uh, closing of that gap to a degree when it comes to covered name brand medications and covered generic medications as well. So you're seeing some different changes put about still by much of the legislation that it was affected by the ACA. So something that comes into play there. Um, to pull those regional benchmark, benchmarks on the plans that are, or the area in which you operate, you can go to the CMS website and it'll lay it out for you um, for the states in which you market. One of the other things that changed is the IRMA legislation. The cost of the Part B premium, the Part D premiums, 
and the extra monies that are required of an individual who is of higher income. We've actually seen a new income tier for the highest of the incomes put in the place that we hadn't had in the past. Um, when you look at LIS and another reason why you want to make certain that you have the information with this in place is for your prospects and clients that qualify for it, well, the average annual value of this assistance program is right around $4,000. And you look at an individual that is of lower income and what a difference that is as a percentage of their overall income, it really, really has a very positive effect for you and for the people you serve. Some of the extra benefits someone gets by qualifying for this, well, in addition to um, the lower premiums, it does allow additional access to prescription drug coverage, particularly for those that have put it off and now are subject to a penalty because it waives that penalty. Depending upon the level of assistance someone qualifies for, it may completely fill the coverage gap, that donut hole that some people are subject to. Remembering as well, it changes how often a person can change their coverage, but they're not locked in for the entire year. They actually have three special election periods through the first nine months, one per quarter. Um, also, when someone makes application for low-income subsidy, it does trigger trigger application for the Medicare Savings Programs as well. This may take a little bit of time, so if a person meets certain qualifications and you know it, you can obviously preempt the system a bit, put in an application for that Medicare Savings Program, and speed the process along. In order for someone to qualify for low-income low subsidy, or as a number of people have reminded me, some people like to address it as extra help. The applicant does have to have Medicare Parts A and B, or Parts A and or B as well. They've got to live within the United States. They have to meet certain criteria. They have to pass an income test based on the federal poverty level. They also have to uh, satisfy a resource or assets test. Many people are deemed eligible automatically because they may have some other type of needs-based benefit that they receive. This includes Medicaid, SSI, or if they've already qualified for a Medicare savings program, they don't need to qualify for this again. Um, they don't need to reapply. And when someone's found eligible, they get the low-income subsidy for at least the remainder of the calendar year. It's a big market. It's a big piece of the market. And what we see, based on some of the numbers in the past, is a lot of people already have this in place. So it's a question of discovering those people to make certain that they exercise the opportunity they have for changing plans, because many don't. And we have already demonstrated that there are reasons why a person should examine their coverage based on medications each and every year the drug list changing, where a drug falls um, within the drug list in that circumstance, the cost of the medications that are involved, new medications that come on the market, and most importantly, the medications that a particular person is accessing as well. So that, in addition to the monies that come into play, give us the, the necessity in order to help people reevaluate their medication coverage on an ongoing basis. If you think about it, because of the way our bodies change, they don't automatically say, okay, you're going to be on the same coverage. You don't need anything extra, at least until the end of the year. Somehow our, our bodies just don't work that way. If a person qualifies for an opportunity to change coverage throughout the year, it may well help them address that change in the medications that they are taking as well. When you look at it, many of the people that are on a standalone PDP program qualify for this coverage, and a good portion of the folks that are on an MAPD plan as well also qualify for that assistance. And one of the things that we see on low-income subsidy 
of the people who are not deemed into this assistance, 60% of them don't have low income subsidy even though they qualify for it. So that's one another reason why we always have to be asking the questions because it makes a big difference um, in the lives of the people that we, we visit with. There are different levels of assistance within low income subsidy as well. So there are people who get the full subsidy. These are the people with lower incomes and fewer resources. And there are folks that get partial help. And these are folks that are often referred to as the near poor, uh, the folks with slightly higher incomes, but still within 150% of federal poverty level or lower. Keep in mind, once again, both of them help eliminate at least a portion of the coverage gap and the penalties that they may have incurred by not enrolling in a program when they were first eligible. We do see some telltale signs when it comes to determining whether a person has a uh, low income subsidy in place already. And a lot of that is identified by knowing the co-payments that a person is subject to when they have this extra help. Generic medications have gone from 335 in 2018 to 340. So if you run across somebody who's taking a generic medication and they're paying $3.40 for it, pretty good indication they're probably on low income subsidy. And the name brand medications, the co-payment 2018 over or pardon me, 2019 over 2018 has gone from 835 to 850. So it gives you an idea as to what those co-payments are, and those are for folks that are above 100% of federal poverty level. If someone qualifies for MSP or even SSI or full Medicaid, well, we see a lower co-payment for those individuals too, and how it eliminates the catastrophic payments that a person is subject to across the board otherwise. These are the income and assets that a person has to, to test that they have to satisfy. We're still using 2018 numbers because 2019 isn't released until, well, it used to be April. We're seeing it much earlier now, sometimes into the end of February. But this gives you an indication of what is the maximum gross income a person has not in net income, gross income, for the different assistance levels in different states. Uh, the levels are higher in Alaska and Hawaii rather than the continental United States. The partial subsidies, this gives us an indication of the fact that they still have a small deductible with this assistance where the full subsidy, the deductible is fully covered and they have partial coinsurance for the plans if they're on base coverages. You can affect that by helping them do an analysis on the medications they take to see which of the plans available to them in their market where they live to make certain that they have the best deal going for them. These numbers are also, obviously it goes up to the 150% of the income and assets test once again. Oh, the income test should be, I should say, instead of the assets test, are lower in the continental United States for this portion of coverage as well as compared to Alaska and Hawaii. Again, what counts as income, Social Security benefits, um, retirement, railroad retirement, any pensions or annuities, including veteran pensions, if they're still working, that comes into play, any alimony they receive, or net rental income as well. It does include certain types of assistance, um, food stamps, SNAP, um, fuel assistance. We have some information on that later in the presentation for you as well. There's also a disregard of a little piece of their income and certain work expenses for those who get social security benefits. Social security benefits, easy for me to say, based on a disability or blindness. That cheat sheet from the National Council on Aging will help you as well. Um, the countable benefits, once again, come into play just uh, as they do with Medicare savings programs um, where certain things are included and certain things are excluded. 
logical stuff is included. Some of the stuff that's laid out, one vehicle, one car, um, certain cash surrender of life insurance, household uh, goods, those sorts of things, uh, a portion of the burial trust and burial contracts as well. A person can go in and apply for extra help through the Social Security website or the benefits checkup site. And they could also do things by paper. Strongly recommend people do things electronically. It's much quicker and much cleaner of a process as well. So there are also the, these are hot links for you that can take you to those particular sites to help you with um, that assistance if you want to become involved with your prospect and client to help them get the benefit. I would strongly recommend it. It is a compliant process. Um, you're doing your prospect and client a service um, and you're doing it in a fashion that the government condones. These are also additional hot links that can help you. And then if you want um, a video option for the National Council on Aging, this link will take you to that. It is a circumstance where, uh, once again, you have multiple languages that are available through these options as well. And um, you will see the responses back very quickly. If you were to do a paper application, this is how it looks, and this is the information they ask for, the base information on the individual, name, address, social security number, different pieces of information about their income and assets, uh, what their household looks like with the number of individuals that come into play, because obviously there are different limits for an individual versus couple, and this is how the award letter looks um, that they receive after the determination has been made as to whether or not they qualify. For the assistance. Um, and as I mentioned before, it does give people quick turnaround on the assistance and they know very quickly whether or not they qualify for the help. Some additional information on links that will give you more ways of providing the information they need to see if they qualify or should even chase it. Once again, quarterly basis versus a monthly basis now. They do receive a ton of mailing on this, even though many folks will see a letter from the government and they may or may not open it. They do have a ton of information that is sent to them on the different programs that are available to them. It is important to note that not everyone who qualifies for the extra help program on medications qualify for the Medicare savings programs, which may affect medical expense help as well because there are different levels of assistance there. These are Medicaid administered programs um, that are a joint effort between the state of residence and the national government and different levels of assistance come into play. As I mentioned earlier, the qualified individual and the slimby, slimby, the qualified low income beneficiary, those folks only get help with their Part B premium and not any of the medical expense and those are folks that may not have that in play as well. For those folks with QDWI, these are the medically disabled who have gone back to work, different levels, it's a different population entirely. You don't run across that population um, too very often. Um, much of the benefits that they have here, we have to keep in mind that many people who are on Medicaid in a nursing home, the levels of assistance and the levels of qualification are much different than they are in these circumstances. This also is the information based on IRMA, what a person would pay for their Part B premium. Obviously, if someone is of higher income, they won't qualify for assistance on those premiums. That gives you an indication of the, the income of the folks that you're visiting with. Different governmental agencies come into play. The low-income subsidy extra help program is a federal program. You don't see a lot of play coming from the individual states with the Medicare savings programs. You do. Who's eligible for an MSP? Well, they got to have Medicare Part A. They got to meet income and assets tests once again, and the applications can be submitted through the local Medicaid agency or Social Security office. That eligibility is generally redetermined each year as well. 
This gives you a nice sheet to speak to the income and assets for these different levels of assistance. Um, it's a nice sheet then that you can reference a single number and help determine whether or not a person should even attempt a process to qualify because you will run into some people that qualify based on their income, but they may have more than one house uh, and the assets test knocks them out. So some different things with just base information that allows you to become comfortable with what's necessary. Keep in mind it does exclude one house and one car, certain other assets as well. This is one of the reasons why we continue to give this particular presentation on uh, through multiple presentations is the fact that there are a ton of individuals who qualify for these assistance programs and don't have it in place. And part of it may be due to the agents that are helping them if they do have an agent who simply doesn't ask one more question. I wanna help you qualify for all the assistance that is available to you is your income below QI1 level? As a single person, is your income $1,400 or so or below? If it, that is the case, you will see someone that may qualify for extra help, and it is an entirely different situation for you. This is a great sheet to have as part of your presentation uh, booklet because you don't have to memorize all the numbers that come into play. You just need to know what's the maximum income for an individual or a couple, and then the assets test, excluding that house car and the other things that were on one of the other sheets um, to see if someone can qualify for this help. Some of the reasons why people don't have it in play, they don't know it's there. Or if it's an MSP program, we saw how relatively simple the extra help from the medication coverage is some of the Medicare savings programs in different states, um, that process, the application process can be a little long. Someone went to 14 to 20 pages. And some people, even if they get that app, they don't have a way to get to somewhere where someone can help them. And we're dealing with a proud generation who doesn't want to deal with a misplaced social stigma thinking they're on welfare. So. You can help them with the medication process indirectly or directly, sending them to Social Security or a case uh, worker or social worker, or depending upon the carriers within you, the portfolio of products that you offer, many of them offer assistance through the benefits checkup or through My Advocate or another program that helps them qualify for the different assistance programs that are out there. Some of the things that come into play, the MSP application takes longer uh, than the low income subsidy, where the low income subsidy, you generally have an information or determination within a couple of weeks. Um, the Medicare savings programs can take a couple of months, depending upon the level of assistance. However, they will go back and back credit some of that coverage as well. For those folks who qualify based on income, or assets, they, they kick one or the other. If they look to move that, well, there is a that excess. There is a look back on these programs, so that's something to be mindful of. When you deal with this population as well, most of the states now have a requirement that the company offering a dual special needs program um, have a contract with the state. So a lot of the billing issues that we saw frequently in the not so distant past don't come into play nearly as often, but you need to be aware of them. For folks that have the QMB status, these are people that should not be sold a Medigap policy. So it does make a difference as to the portfolio products that you have available for those individuals. And uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that we're out there to help them and not to harm them. So this gives us some additional information as to timelines as to when these assistance programs come into play. There's a ton of resources linked to this. Um, this presentation, I'm chatting much too much. It's going a little longer than usual. So 
So I want to make certain that you have these links to access um, at your leisure. Some of the additional information programs that are available, the National Council on Aging does have a program that speaks to the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, sometimes referred to as food stamps, um, the program to help people with the cost of home energy, and for the folks that are of particularly low income, what it takes to get on uh, Supplemental Security Income programs as well, SSI. Some of the additional things that we do to help you with this population well, we want to make certain that you're covered for all the carriers that you contract with. So we offer discounted E&O that allows you to operate as a truly independent insurance agent where this coverage for that small monthly premium covers you for all the companies with whom you contract, regardless of the upline that you place that contract through. We help you with continuing education packages as well on an ongoing basis through our relationship with WebCE. If you're looking to contract with multiple carriers because of the depth of choices a person has in your particular market or for whatever reason, we offer an electronic means of contracting where you create an agent profile and add companies electronically. We also, if you are looking to build an agency and want to help people get into the business, we have programs that come into play to help discount the cost of obtaining a license, an insurance license, and we also offer a discounted, partially underwritten program to help you protect your income, a disability income program for brokers. We do offer a ton of different educational opportunities. We do webinars on a regular basis. They are generally recorded, as this one is today, so you can access them 24-7. Um, some of the past presentations that uh, the content doesn't change as much, a great way to do it at your leisure. We do offer also electronic support, means of enrolling, quoting and enrolling people um, electronically, a way for you to put your social media marketing programs on autopilot through coverage made easy for a small fee. They generate the topics and the information you put out on the different means of social media to make certain that you stay compliant, but also to make certain that we do it consistently. And a full range of additional incentives. Uh, many of the carriers, um, when compliant, will offer additional incentive programs, and we do also offer our own producers convention. This year, we're going to Jamaica in April, next year's program, the qualification of which is 2019 will be announced very shortly. Some of the additional assistance that you can get for lead programs, well, much of what we discussed today for low-income subsidy, you can't cold call to market for it, but you can cold call for the vast majority of Medicare supplement programs and other programs that are demand products, so dental programs, uh, hospital indemnity programs, some of the things that people um, realize the need for and will respond to telephonic efforts. We do have a custom contact list available to you at low or no cost, depending upon your circumstance. We also offer different guidelines for you to follow in order to be effective in grassroots marketing, community-based marketing through retail programs, faith-based opportunities, dealing with churches and temples and uh, other places of worship a way to effectively market with providers, not just doctors, but also dentists or other providers of care for the programs that we market. Some of the carriers do offer assistance in leads as well. We want to help direct you to those carriers and the programs that they have available. You do have access to the internet leads. Um, in the Medicare world, you got to be very fastidious as to documenting where your lead came from. So you want to take that into mind, take that into account and in mind when you deal with internet lead companies. And we do offer direct mail support based on production. It's a partial subsidy of the cost of the mail program through four uh, approved vendors. What we're looking to do with this information and the extra assistance that you have is to earn your business. And in order for us to do that, well, obviously, that's a decision you have to make as to what is important 
for your portfolio and the agency and the efforts that you put into it and the products that you market. Make that decision to move forward. We help you with that. You can reach any of the marketers with, prefer, with Premier Marketing through our toll-free number at 1-800-365-8208. Put you in touch with any of our marketers across the country. The list that is on the screen now is for the folks that are in our Texas office. All that said, we realize that the most valuable commodity that you have is your time. You've invested around an hour of that with us today. We thank you for that. We look forward to the opportunity to speak to you. Watch for the follow-up that will come to you by email on the program that you have now. And we wish you good selling and good luck in your efforts moving forward. Look forward to visiting with you soon. Thanks so much.